Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the third installment of ThorLab's microscopy webinar series, How to Build a Microscope. Today's presentation is about fluorescent microscopy, technology, fundamentals, and applications. We're excited to present this talk as fluorescence is such a critical technique that offers a number of advantages traditional imaging platforms and contract methods cannot provide. I am Sergey Matviv, and your moderator for today, an application specialist at ThorLab's Imaging Systems Division, where we develop microscopy systems for life sciences. I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Wei Sun. Wei works with the both customers and the R&D team to develop new technologies that enable research and discoveries. Her background is in multiphoton microscopy and adaptive optics, and she has her PhD in physics from Boston University. Before joining Thor Labs, Wei was a postdoc at Genelia Research Campus of Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Please note that QA will be open throughout the event and you can submit your questions at any time. The QA button can be found at the top right of your screen. And now it is my pleasure to yield the floor to Wei. Thank you, Sergey, for the introduction. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on fluorescence microscopy. This webinar is brought to you by the Tholab's Imaging System team. This is the third talk in our How to Build a Microscope webinar series. In our first and second webinars, we discuss the basics of microscope design and transmit light imaging. Today, I'll be building upon those two previous talks and we will focus on fluorescence microscopy where we'll discuss basic principles in fluorescence with a few applications in life sciences and the hardware components that are used in the wide field microscope that creates fluorescence images. We'll also have three more upcoming webinars. The next one will be focused on uh, we'll focus on um, laser scanning techniques where confocal and multi-photon imaging are based on. And the next one, one of them will be on DIY microscopy. And the last one will be on advanced imaging techniques. So stay tuned. All right, so let's start today's talk with the basics of fluorescence. Fluorescence is really a phenomenon that's describing the absorption and emission of light by substance. It's nicely illustrated by Giblancy diagram, which I'm showing here, a simplified version. There are uh, three energy states. As uh, energy goes up, uh, the, 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 as the, the physical location of the states go up, the energy level go up. Um, the lowest uh, energy level is called the ground state. And I also have the excited singlet states as higher energy states and the excited triplet states are the states that are in between energy level between the singlet and the ground state. The difference between the singlet and triplet states is uh, involving electron spins, which we're not going into today. A fluorescent process starts with the substance seeing light in form of an energy. An electron in the substance absorbs that portion of light or energy and jumps up to a higher excited singlet states. Then it follows through a process called vibrational relaxation and goes down to the lowest state in the excited state. This is a process that you can imagine it as a heat dissipation, um, as energy relaxation. And as we know the real physics that all electrons or all materials like to go back to their lowest energy state, the tendency will um, cause the electrons to jump back down to the ground state by emitting what we call a fluorescence photon. And in this case, the time scale is around nanosecond to micron, microsecond. Once the electron is in the single state, it doesn't have to go back down as a fluorescent photon. It can also go to the triplet state um, by intersystem crossing. This is a process that doesn't emit any light, so it's called irradiative relaxation. While it's in the triplet state, it hangs around for a little longer. Um, and then it jumps back down in the form of a photon, and this is a process that's termed phosphorescence. We can see that the time scale level is around milliseconds or even hundreds of seconds. These are the objects that we can see in our daily life um, as the glow-in-the-dark toys. Um, that's why they, they actually emit you know, light for a prolonged period of time. 
What we just described is the process, what we call linear absorption. That's when one photon was absorbed and the subsequent photon is emitted as fluorescence. It's also nonlinear absorption. In this case, two photons, each one with half of the energy as the previous uh, photon in the linear absorption case was seen by the substance at the same time. And because it's treated as the exact same, you know, absorption energy transition, the same fluorescence photon is being emitted subsequently. This process has the less probability of occur occurring, so it has tighter, um, you know, limitation and restriction for it to occur, but it also has a lot of advan advantages that we will go into um, in our next webinar. We've been talking a lot about energy transition and, and absorbing, you know, light or photons. So there is a relationship between energy and the wavelength of light. And in this case, um, it's important to, to, to remember that it's inversely proportional, meaning um, if the photon is um, uh, within the visible spectrum towards more of a blue side, it has a shorter wavelength, but it ha actually has a higher energy. And that's why I'm depicting here with a blue arrow as the higher energy photon, like for example, a blue photon being absorbed and then a lower energy photon, um, the green photon is being emitted. And in the nonlinear process, because the two photons are being absorbed, each one have half of the energy as the blue photon previously, it actually has lower energy, each one of them, than the fluorescence photon, which, is, which makes things interesting. And we can also visualize the absorption process by an absorption spectrum of a substance or a fluorophore. In this case, I'm using green fluorescence protein, um, GFP, as an example. We can see that first, absorption is a function of wavelength. And as we remember from our previous energy to wavelength relationship, the set of wavelength corresponds to a set of energy transitions that an electron is capable of, uh, of doing. And we also see that the curve has a peak somewhere for GFP around nine, four, 490 nanometers. That basically tells us that's the wavelength that this electron in the GFP molecule is prefer. It, it prefers this wavelength to be excited. It just has a higher chance of um, being excited and emitting photon later on. Similar thing happens while it's emitting, even though it's a totally dependent process, uh, uh, the wavelength dependency of emission is also similar as it's going through this set of wavelength, meaning these are the energy, um, different energy transitions that this molecule is being able to achieve. Uh, we have to remember that this is, the, the emission wave uh, spectrum is actually a signature to a certain substance. After it's being excited, it will always emit this curve. And the peak of the curve is also that is the highest probability of the energy transition corresponding to this wavelength. In this case, it's 5, 520 or 510, something like that. Um, uh, in this energy transition, that is more preferred. Now we notice here that there is a shift in the absorption and the emission spectrum. And that is termed um, that so that's basically caused by the vibration or relaxation or heat dissipation that we mentioned during the uh, uh, the electron energy transitions. And this the shift in the peaks is termed Stoke shift. In this case, for the GFP molecule, the Stoke shift is 21 nanometers. The Stoke shift is also a signature of different fluorophores. Here I am giving two other examples. One of them is a blue fluorescence protein, BFP. The Stoke shift in this case is 55 because the emission wavelength is more towards the blue. So it needs, a, in the linear situation, needs a higher energy, so a more purple or more ultraviolet photon to excite it. So you can see that this is the excitation peak and this is the emission peak. For another uh, floor for that I'm giving as an example is called the TD tomato. That is a more red color dye um, or, you know, floor, uh, actually, yeah, floor four. Um, and it's being uh, excited around an orange um, uh, range and I met in more in the in the red side of the spectrum. And in this case, the stoke shift of this dye or this floor four is 26 nanometers. Um, we really want to make sure that the stoke shift of the fluorophore that we pick is at least, you know, uh, 
a few tens of you know nan nanometers or else once it gets too close it's really difficult to separate um, uh, optically which we'll go into later so this is how we actually get a uh, three color image on on the on the right this is red hippocampus um uh, the, the blue color is labeled as uh, uh, it's a nuclei label so it's new it, it labels the nuclei of the cell and then um the red is the uh, as a neural filament and uh, green is glia cells uh, these are the brain cells in a in, in a red so we, we talked about how fluorescence is generated, right? But then why are we using fluorescence? Um, first advantage is that it's it's a contrast mechanism. Um, we can see in the uh, peer, the, the, the two uh, images that we, we have here, they're both mouse retinal images. They're all mounted in a slice. The one in the left, the one on the left is uh, captured by differential interference contrast, DIC, which we uh, explained extensively in our previous webinar. You can see that we see the morphology of the cells. Uh, we see almost like a 3D structure, but the background is relatively high, so we don't have a very good contrast. On on the on on, on the right, um, it's a fluorescence image of the same. Uh, it's not exactly the same sample, but it's the same type of sample. It's it's also mouse retina. In this case, you can see because fluorescence is generation of photon, the background is actually ideally dark. Another advantage, I'm just conveniently using the same images. Uh, the, the second advantage of using um, fluorescence is that it can potentially be biologically spe specific because we have all these different, uh, we can have the whole spectrum, different color, different dyes, different uh, proteins or different uh, uh, staining me method methods to label different cell types. So we can actually determine um, different either interaction or, or morphology or structural relationship between different cells with fluorescence imaging, which is not going to be uh, feasible uh, without um, this technique. Uh, for example, in the DIC, in the DIC image, you won't be able to tell which cell is uh, is, is 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 biologically different unless they are very clearly morphologically different. So the the color. Um, of uh, a fluorescence image gives you another layer of information. The third advantage that we would like to point out is it adds to um, your existing um, uh, imaging setup. So we can we see both images uh, underneath one the one on the left is mouse kidney, the one on the right is uh, ferret neurons. They're both um, DIC images superimposed with fluorescence image. You can see that we can have structural information by uh, the DIC contrast, uh, and, and on top of that, we can have biologically related information. Uh, for example, like only a subset of the cells being labeled by fluorescence. The last but not the least uh, uh, advantage of fluorescence is that it has the potential. Right? It can use it can be used to do quantitative and functional imaging. What we're seeing here is a movie um, of mouse neurons expressing GCAMP. GCAMP here is a green um, uh, 404 that can um, be genetically encoding a subset of neurons in a mouse brain. At the same time, the fluorescence intensity of these uh, fluorophores is directly related to calcium ion activities within the neurons. And calcium spikes, can also uh, is a proxy to basically let us know what neuron action potential or activity is going on. So you see the flickering of these four fours, and that indicates that the, the 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 brain cells within the mouse is actually firing and doing all kinds of processing themselves. And what we can do is after we capture all these flickering cells, and if we plot them along the time axis. We can see all these different cells, how they respond to each other, whether one is on top of another or one is more subsequent to the other. So again, that quantitativeness adds another layer of information to the data that we're capturing. Now that we discuss um, the fluorescence basics and, uh, and the applications, let's move on to see what makes them uh, you know, what make those images. So I'm showing here a microscope setup. This is one of the one type of microscope setup. It's just an upright microscope. Um, 
the key components are light sources, illum illuminator, filter wheel or filter cube, objectives, and detection. And I will go through each of them in detail. Let's start with the light sources. We see here on um, the, the left is uh, light emitting spectra by uh, the different light sources, uh, different traditional labs. Here the uh, three circles that I circle out are for the, the, the mercury lamps. Uh, you see as the HG100 and 200. The mercury lamps, historically, they have been the gold standard for fluorescence imaging because of these three peaks. They line up very nicely for the excitation peaks uh, for the blue, green, and red um, fluorescence uh, for fluorophores. Um, later on, um, the xenon lamp, which was showing as the green curve, they, they became more popular because of um, the environmental concern caused by the disposal of the mercury lamps. Um, and late and, and as the as the development of the LEDs, we can see that each one of the LEDs they have much narrower emitting spectrum, but we can also optically couple multiple LEDs together to focus or target on the different floor force absorption peaks. There are quite a few advantages that uh, for using LEDs uh, as an illumination source. One of them is the discrete. Uh, excitation gives you very high efficiency in your excitation. You don't have to spread out the entire, uh, you know, uh, white light spectrum and only cut off a portion of it for excitate for exciting your, your your sample. Each color can be dedicated for each floor for in in the LED uh, excitation case. Um, also, their intensity is also conveniently controlled. Um, uh, the intensity of the LEDs, you can just change the current that is going to the LED and um, the, the intensity will go up and down. It also being able to control by just, you know, electronic signal, you, it has fast switch, switching speed and triggering of um, LEDs in uh, optogenetic stimulation processes. Um, it's widely used in, in the sense as well. And another thing is also maintenance cost, right? You don't have to um, change your light bulb when you're using an LED because it has much longer lifetime than the bulbs. Uh, when it comes to the functional imaging that we touched on uh, earlier, the output stability, the intensity stability of excitation source becomes also very important because any flickering in your light source will cause artifacts in the emission uh, intensity. The emission intensity will become a result of the changes in your in in excitation intensity. So that's what you also want to avoid if you're doing functional imaging or any quantitative um, measurements. Um, last but not the least, uh, LEDs are just cooler. <laughs> they 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 don't emit as much heat as um as the regular lamps. And next, I'll go into illuminator and filter cubes. The purpose of using the illuminator is really to create a uniform and well controlled illumination onto the sample. There are optics in the illuminator. And the goal of the optics is really to project the filament of the lamp or the chip of the LED to infinity so that um, it can really, sorry, to, to, to image, sorry, to image the filament onto the back um, uh, uh, focal plane of the objective lens. So that when the objective lens projects the filament or the, the LED chip to infinity, you have a, uh, a uniform illumination onto your sample. And the next one is there is a fill stop within the illuminator. The idea of the fill stop is really to limit the size of illumination within the sample. For example, you only are interested in exciting a, a, a portion of the field of view while you want to preserve the rest of them. Either it's for um, a functional pu uh, purpose or, or, or uh, reduce you know, your, your photo illumination or phototoxicity to the sample. So this is a well controlled method. There is also traditionally an aperture stop. The aperture stop is used to control illumination intensity during the time where the lamp intensity is difficult to control. And right now, uh, a lot of the lamps also come with a neutral density filter as well as uh, LEDs are easily controlled in terms of their in intensity. Um, this aperture stop is relatively obsolete. And the last part of the illuminator is a mechanical housing 
for your filter cube and filter wheel. Now let's go into the filter cubes. The filter cubes are arranged in this fashion. It has to, the excitation filter will first block out a, a part of the emission, I mean, sorry, the excitation light. A dichroic mirror is a mirror that will reflect part of the uh, spectrum while it will transmit another part of the spectrum. So in this case, it will reflect the selected blue um, uh, uh, excitation onto the sample and um, pass through the green emission and towards the uh, detector. The emission filter further clean up the uh, emission after uh, that's being transmitted by the dichroic. Um, excitation and emission filter usually looks like a circular and it has an arrow that is specific, uh, specifically pointing out the, the direction of light propagation. So uh, when you install the, uh, uh, the, uh, the excitation and emission filters, make sure that the arrow is following the, the, the direction of the light. And this is how you read the spec or the part number of a uh, of a bandpass filter in this case. Um, so the the uh, the number, the first number that you see, 469, that indicates the center wavelength that it, the, the the band is for, uh, is centered on. And then the number after the dash is uh, where the the bandwidth is. It's where the 90 percent uh, uh, transmission um, is across. So in this case, it's 35 nanometers. Acroic usually looks like a, a, a rectangle um, and then the it has the cutoff wavelength indicated in its part number. So um, anything that is higher than this 498 nanometers is going to be transmitted um, uh, uh, and uh, anything that's lower than 40, 498, it's, uh, it's going to be reflected. And this is a long pass dichroic. There are also short pass dichroics, then um, the cutoff will basically flip. Anything that is shorter will go through. Uh, anything that is longer will be reflected. Um, there are also multi-band and, and whatnot. Uh, so those are uh, going into further details. And this is basically how a cube looks like. So first the source will hit the um, excitation filter, the light will get down to the sample and then hit the dichroic. The emission will go through the dichroic and go through the emission filter and hit the detector. Let's let it play again. So um, after it's being arranged this way, we can superimpose the uh, excitation filter, the bandpass filter on top of the absorption spectrum. So what we're doing is we're trying to see how much of this absorption spectrum is being illuminated by the, uh, that's, a, that's allowed by the uh, excitation filter to get down to the sample. Same thing, um, the Emission filter after superimposing on the emission spectrum will let you know how much you're letting it through to get to the detector. And in between them, the red curve we see here is the uh, uh, the dichroic spectrum. So we see that the two peaks are nicely separated. And when there is multiple colors or multiple fluorophores that are involved in one sample, you may want to go to um, a filter wheel that you can flip through it um, to go to to image different fluorophores at different time. And in this case, um, for example, together with the green, we just show you can have a blue uh, a fluorophore in your sample that is cut off um, uh, nicely also by these bandpass and uh, dichroics. And with the TD tomato example that we also showed earlier, we also have a set of um, filter set that is uh, fit for this floor for. And you can imagine that you can have all these three different floor uh, uh, filter sets in three different compartments of the filter uh, of the filter wheel. And then you can just uh, you know manually or mo there's motorized filter wheel as well to flip through them, and then you capture different floor first at different time. Next, we'll go into objective. Objectives is really, um, I consider it as one of the uh, most critical elements that's related with image quality. And um, image quality has a lot of uh, to do, a lot to do with uh, aberration. So um, you really want to look at the, uh, uh, when you select an objective, right? So you want to look at if, the, if there's any um, aberration corrections. In this case, um, it's marked plan on the objective lens. That means it's got 
flat field correction. That means it's aberration free um, across the field of view, so you won't have um, any um, distortion um, uh, when it's getting to the side or the edge of the field of view. Next one is a uh, chromatic correction. That's term floor or um, apple. So uh, basically, when there's multiple colors involved in uh, in, a, in your sample, you will like them to be uh, optically and physically lined up so that you don't have any um, uh, chromatic aberration, meaning lateral or axial shift while the the, the, the the object is in the same location, but because of the, the light travels to different light path, it gets to the camera or the, or the detector at a different location, so it actually seems separated. Next one is a uh, numerical aperture, or uh, NA. Um, this is an important uh, uh, parameter that we actually went into extensively in our first webinar, so I'll uh, briefly touch on and, and describe a little bit um, on the on the things that we also we previously mentioned. Um, so basically, uh, the NA uh, is an important factor that plays a role in optical resolution. I mean, in this, in, in this case, I'm showing the lateral resolution formula uh, uh, in the fluorescence microscopy case. It's uh, emission uh, wavelength divided by two, um, uh, new, two times a numerical aperture. We can see that numerical aperture plays an important role here as uh, you want a higher um, uh, numerical aperture if you want to achieve a higher or, or finer optical resolution. But at the end of the day, this optical resolution is really a, a physical limit. An optic, optical limit that is uh, uh, ruled by the, the, uh, the fraction of light. So at the end of the day, it's the emission wavelength that is determining um, uh, the physical limit. You won't be able to get anything smaller than half of that. Um, and then another thing that we didn't touch on and what I wanted to emphasize in this case is the light gathering power that is also uh, determined by the numerical aperture of the objective lens. You can see in the formula below here, it's towards it's proportional to the square of the numerical aperture. And this is on the illumination case, right? If you're using the same objective, uh, meaning that you're doing an FP detection to collect the same, uh, to, to collect the fluorescence image with the same objective, we actually need to square this again, so it will be uh, become uh, NA to the power of four. So you can see that if you really wanted to have a high NA if you want to gather, you know, as much light as possible, that will increase your signal to noise. And another factor that also plays in here is the magnification, which is in the denominator here, the, 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 the capital M. Um, and that magnification um, is also depicted on the uh, on the on the on the objective lens, um, and it's inversely proportioned you know, to uh, to the magnification. So in the ideal case, right, you can imagine that the, the, the objective that has the highest light gathering power will be the one that has the highest NA, but with the lowest magnification. So yeah, so high NA and low magnification will give you brighter images. And then um, I want to also touch on a, a, a point that is often you know, uh, overlooked. Uh, so it's a cover slip correction on the objective lens. Some objective lens will clearly tell you the objective lens of uh, cover glass uh, correction range. In this case, uh, in this objective is 0 0.11 to 0 0.23 uh, millimeters. It also has a correction collar for you to adjust it. The reason for that is it's actually quite important to um, to to match the uh, the correction um, with the sample, the actual cover slip that you're using. In a lot of the objectives that doesn't say on the on the actual objective what uh, cover glass thickness that it's correcting for, um, it's a lot of them are actually corrected for number 1.5, which is 0.17 millimeter thickness. And I'm going to show you the effect of um, cover glass mismatch in this case, right? So if you have a cover glass that is thicker or thinner than um, the designed cover glass thickness, um, it's going to create what's called spherical aberration, which I'm showing here on the Y axis. And in the X axis is the changes or the mismatch of the cover glass thickness, right? And then we also have a dollar line here that I want to point out. It's called the fraction limit. Anything that is under the or below the diffraction limit the line is not optically resolvable. So any aberration that is lower than this dollar line can be uh, can be neglected. Well, let's see when the numerical aperture of the objective lens is relatively low here. It's under 0.3. So as we 
do you, so the zero it means there's the exact same cover glass that we were using in, in the sample as the, the objective is designed to to have. Um, and then as we go to like 0.5 millimeter mismatch, right? It's a 0.5 thinner or uh, a thicker, uh, 0.5 millimeter thicker than what it's designed. The, the spherical aberration is still under the diffraction limit. However, when we go to higher NA, meaning uh, in this case, I'm showing 0.4 and 0.5 NA, um, the, you can see that the curve gets steeper, uh, that the line gets steeper. And um, for, for 0.4 NA, you're already getting out of your diffraction limited range um, when you're uh, at 0.2 millimeters different. And when um, it's low, it's below uh, 0.1 millimeter different when it's uh, when it's a point uh, NA of 0.5, and you can imagine that when your NA gets higher, right, even towards you know 0 0.6, 0 0.8, or even 1.0, it's going to go a lot steeper. So it really depends on the NA of the objective lens that you're using. The higher NA you want, you really want to make make sure that you check with the manufacturer if it's not clearly stated on the objective lens what cover glass thickness you should use. And um, and then so the next one I would like to go into is the detection. And in this case, we'll focus on camera. We actually had a an extensive uh, discussion on camera technology and and, and camera applications. I mean, uh, one of our previous uh, webinars are uh, given by Martin. So I, I really uh, encourage you to check that out. It's uh, I will I will um, only briefly uh, go through what the important considerations are. So for fluorescence in microscopy, uh, a camera, we're really depending it on for the sampling resolution, not the optical resolution, but the sampling resolution. In this case, a camera pixel size plays a role. Um, and in Martin's uh, uh, webinar, we heard that the pixel size really should be about, uh, uh, you know, a third of the optical resolution that we just had the, uh, you know, the fundamental limit multiplied by the magnification of, um, of the objective. Of course, we are assuming that your, your camera, uh, uh, you know, camera tube is, is 1x. There's no extra magnification after the, the, the objective lens. And the, and, and the next thing that it's uh, determining is your temporal resolution. Um, when considering the speed of the camera, uh, you really want to look at uh, the, your, your application, right? The, what is the dynamics that in your specimen that you want to capture? And you, you want to pick a camera that's faster than that, but at the same time, you also want to consider the signal level from your sample as well as the camera's quantum efficiency. So that determines your sensitivity and, 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 and signal to noise overall um, in, your, <clears throat> in, in your image. And that will also, you know, sometimes allow you to go faster or sometimes it will force you to go lower, uh, I mean slower. This also go into like a little bit of, you know, uh, in fluorescence imaging, we talked about it, it's colorful, but we really encourage you to choose a monochrome camera versus a camera, uh, a, co a color camera, because I mean the monochrome and color, they, they, they essentially the chip underneath is the same, but the color camera are basically added a layer of filters on it. They, it's different pixels are being assigned to capture blue, green, and red. First, those bandpass filters are just similar to the bandpass filter that we talked about, but they may not fit the exact floor for that you're looking at. So really, in order to utilize all pixels on your camera and you wanted to you know, be the one who decides what band of the spectrum you're letting through, you want to use a monochrome camera, camera and, um, and carefully choose your excitation uh, dichroic and bandpass filters. And then it, go, it goes into the, the noise of the camera, right? The speed of the camera is tied into the readout speed and also the, 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 the acquisition time, um, how, how much time you need to average a, a, a quiet image will also go into a thermal noise. The rule of thumb is the faster your readout speed is, the faster the read noise will be. Um, the, 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 the longer your integration time becomes, uh, you may need to consider cooling of your camera as your thermal noise will, 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 will come into play. Um, yeah, so um, so we we also have a few recommended cameras um, on our brochure or on our camera brochure, um, and they're all monochrome cameras. Um, the key advantage of them is they have high quantum efficiency, so high sensitivity, as well as they have very no, low noise. And look at um, Martin's previous webinar; it was extensive. It went into all the details of uh, picking a camera. 
Um, last but not the least, I want to touch on uh, a few general pitfalls to avoid or system considerations when you're doing fluorescence imaging. The first one you want to look at, or the first one you want to avoid, is saturation. There are a few different sort of saturations. The first one is you could saturate your fluorophores. That means you're giving it too much excitation, either intensity or exposure. Um, and so the, floor, the fluorophores, if we're talking about in the linear absorption case, right, should put out one photon after absorbing one photon. Let's imagine it's a perfect system, right? The, the quantum efficiency is 100%. Um, but um, nevertheless, the, 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 the relationship between excitation power and emission intensity should be relatively linear. So meaning like the higher you go with your excitation uh, intensity, the higher you have for your emission intensity. Um, however, it won't just happen infinitely, right? So as, so as you increase excitation intensity, the floor for emission will, will, will eventually plateau. So it will the, the, the linear increase will eventually slow down and stop. So that's the, the that's the, the transitioning point that you you're watching out for, right? You wanted to really make sure that your excitation intensity is kept below that plateau. Um, so maintaining your floor for in a healthy environment and and, and, and not saturated um, saturation will will definitely be bad if you're doing um, uh, you know a quantitative uh, measurement because you're technically your 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 relationships is not um, uh, basically you yeah you you run out of dynamic range of the floor for right and 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 also it also plays into uh, saturation also plays into like deterioration of your your uh, resolution as well. Another. Paul, now another part that uh, that can be saturated is your camera or your detector, right? So this uh, is something that you you should definitely look at the histogram of your your camera. In this case, um, uh, you really want to make sure that there's no saturation in your histogram, meaning there is no pixels that's uh, that's beyond the the, the, the highest collection uh, uh, capability of your uh, of your camera chip. And um, you want to make sure that your amplification or your gain on your camera is to a, a certain uh, level that you won't have uh, saturate, saturation pixels as well as um, uh, the integration time right the, the, the time that you are you're, you're capturing your uh, uh, can be shorter if you're already saturating and the next thing um, I want to point out is uh, to avoid uh, spectral bleed through uh, spectral bleed through is a concept when you're doing multicolor imaging and um, a multiple color or multiple four fours are getting into the same channel or the same uh, camera image at a time, um, which makes it difficult to distinguish, right? Because remember, we're using monochrome cam camera. We're just deciding it with the band pass filters. We think that we're gathering, you know, GFP, but at the same time, we may be gathering something else as well if the four four emission is very close. So this is um, when uh, you would want to consider to have well separated fluorophores, uh, meaning that you can look at the basically the the, the spectra um, and also play superimpose the band passes filter uh, band pass filters on top of them, and making make sure that they, there's no overlap. Uh, and this is also when you wanted to choose your appropriate light source. For example, uh, uh, either have a more, uh, you know, uh, a more appropriate wavelength of LED excitation, or narrow down your excitation filter on your broadband light sources to make sure you don't excite two floor force at the same time, um, unless it's intentional. Um, and also when you go into a uh, detection filter, um, of course, you always wanted to have a wide uh, detection filter so that you collect most of the spectrum, but you also need it to be narrow so that it, there's no overlap. And the next thing I wanted to touch on is, is what's called photo bleaching. Um, Photo bleaching, um, uh, if we go back to our diagram, diagram, um, uh, it, it's similar process, right? So a, a, a electron is being um, excited from the ground state to the single states. Um, instead of, uh, you know, jumping back down to the ground state and emitting a fluorescence uh, photon, it went into inter-system crossing and, and went into that uh, triplet state, right? Remember the triplet states has much longer lifetime, right, than the, than the single state. So there is a higher chance for the electrons to hang around here and have other interaction instead of jumping back down, right, uh, and fluorescence as a, a phosphorus as, as a photon, right? So while the electron is hanging around in the triplet state, 
it went into permanent covalent modification. What it, what what means is it, it saw another excitation photon and it, or it had some other interaction and it just boom, it, it's gone. It basically the end result is that electron is lost. It's not available for like to jump to jump back down to the to the ground state and 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 you know go back into this light generation cycle anymore. So this is something that we want to uh, you know, avoid because then if there's photo bleaching, your fluorophore, your sample is just going to like seem dimmer and dimmer because the electrons are just, you know, they're lost. In, in order to avoid that, um, the first thing you want to look at is um, you, uh, you want to pick more photostable uh, dyes, right? So uh, we talked about a lot about you know chances or probabilities here. Like there are some, there are there are dyes or there are fluorophores there that just have you know higher chance to go into triplet state. Um, they're, 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 those are not even like well, it's that, that optimized for even fluorescence, right? Because the higher chance of going into triplet state will have lower chance of going into singlet state, and only the ones that are in the single state will will, will become fluorescence photons. So you really want to pick the ones that that has higher cross section or high probability to 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 give you uh, you know fluorescence instead of you know phosphorescence. Um, and then, and then the second thing to look at is uh, is uh, is again right to to reduce uh, your excitation like exposure. That's in both intensity as well as uh, time exposure, right? So, um, uh, as the electrons hanging around in the triplet state, if it doesn't see another excitation light or it doesn't see you know uh, other uh, you know uh, uh, factors, it has less chance of you know uh, boom going to the to to, to the cloud um, and also when there is uh, uh, cases where you can modulate your your light exposure you, uh, you can shut it off while you you don't need it um, um, that will be that will be recommended as well and then there's also uh, anti-fade uh, mounting media if your sample is uh, suitable for mounting um, because the environmental factor also plays a role in uh, in encouraging and, and suppressing uh, photo bleaching um, and and then another another uh, you know way is also going going to the multi photon fluorescence right we talked about um in our Yabonsi diagram earlier uh, for so I'm showing it here in uh, on top it's the linear absorption um in 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 thicker samples right uh, and we see that in linear absorption the blue excitation light is uh, illuminating or focused into the sample because it's the whole column right the whole depth sees. The blue the, the the blue photon and so the whole depth is participating in this fluorescence generation process while in multi photon or in nonlinear absorption case right uh, the probability is is lower so it's a, a much harder thing to do um, in this case right so only the 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 the, fo the focal point so only when the photons are dense enough uh, this process is is achievable so that's how you basically by switching to nonlinear absorption you actually preserve your samples on top and below your focal point they're not participating in this fluorescence generation process and you only have the one in the focal point that is potentially you know uh, uh, susceptible, susceptible to photo bleaching and then you control your excitation power or exposure uh, within um, this regime and then uh, you you preserve the out of focus um, uh, content or material and we do have our next webinar on laser scanning techniques that will go into much further detail in nonlinear fluorescence process so stay tuned and um, and join us for that and at the end, um, I would like to thank uh, thank you for your time and participation. Um, and I uh, I uh, would like to take all questions uh, if there's any. So Sergey, back to you. Thank you, thank Wei, you for Wei. the great presentation. Uh, we have a few questions that I'm going to address to you. Uh, so the first question is. Uh, is fluorescence microscopy and wild field microscopy the same? So um, the simple answer is no. <laughs> so fluorescence microscopy is basically there's two two words in here. One is fluorescence, one is microscopy, right? So fluorescence is uh, basically the, the process uh, that we that we talked about, and I also mentioned that there's a, a nonlinear processes that will also create uh, fluorescence photons. Uh, I focused on the wide field uh, microscopy in this talk because. 
the nonlinear part of the uh, or actually part of the linear. So when, when it gets into confocal for its presence, right? That's a linear uh, for uh, process as well, but those have completely different hardware, right? So those uh, uh, requires laser. A lot of them require laser scanning. Um, there's also, you know, uh, spinning disk for confocal as well, but the hardware that is the totally separate uh, topic, which we will go into detail in our next webinar. So that's why I, I would like to focus this talk on only the wide field uh, microscope. But but no, for instance, microscopy can be wide field, can be even it, it, yeah, it can be laser scanning, meaning like non not wide field, so uh, point point detect uh, with a point detector. So yeah, did I answer the question? I think so. Uh, the next one will be about the working distance. Uh, can you comment on the working distances for fluorescence imaging? Uh, are long working distances possible in order of 25 millimeters? I see, I see. So we're 25 millimeter working distance. Um, that's very long. Um, it depends on uh, what your sample setting is, right? So 25 millimeter, if we're doing a, uh, uh, if we're talking about upright microscope, right, uh, uh, as an example, um, it will definitely be an air objective. So um, it, if you need water immersion, then it's definitely not, probably going to be very difficult unless we have some physical constraint. Um, to have a water, water column that is 25 millimeter long. Um, but in terms of, you know, um, the the optics, right? Uh, I mean, we can we can have optical design to have a 25 millimeter working distance, um, you know, objective. Um, but I, there's a lot of other considerations that needs to go into this, right? The NA, the aperture. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think we can't just discuss the working distance as an independent parameter. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure if I if I understand this, uh, the question correctly. I I will just summarize quickly. Uh, yes, the working distance of 25 millimeters is possible, but it always goes on expense of the numerical aperture, uh, meaning that you have to have a very bright illumina uh, illumination to make such a working distance objective working. And uh, the last question on the line is, is there any function of the aperture diaphragm in epifluorescence microscope, is there any other way to get uniform illumination aside from color illumination? What was the first part of the question? Sorry. Um, is there any function of the aperture diaphragm in any in epiflor uh, epifluorescence microscope? So yeah, so the the, the aperture diaphragm, right? It, it is basically to limit the intensity of the excitation light onto the sample. Um, it's uh, it was you it was you know it was necessary right uh, when the uh, 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 the intensity of the, the the light was not conveniently adjustable, um, but right now since a lot of the even the lamps have a knob on their uh, uh, their housing that you can uh, adjust the, the 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 intensity or the the LED you can even electronically modulate them right so the the aperture diaphragm becomes less and less useful in a sense. But but yeah, but the primary purpose of an aperture uh, diaphragm is to limit the uh, the amount of light uh, that is getting to the 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 the, the, the sample in the in an epifluorescent setting. And I think the second part of it is uh, what was what was the second part of the question? I forgot. Uh, give me one second. I've got. Um, is there a uh, is there another way to get uniform illumination aside from color illumination? So, so yeah, so as long as um, you, so it really depends on the, the, the application, right? So color is convenient in a way that you know that you're projecting your, your, your filament, um, uh, you know, by the objective to infinity. So you know that you, 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 you're in good hands. Um, but there's also that like, you can have uh, the light coming um, from like technically infinity, right? You can have a uh, what is a what is called a gooseneck lamp, or you can have a, a liquid light guy that it scrambles the, the the light enough, and if you project them far enough away towards your sample, um, you you can achieve a, a relative uh, uniform illumination as well. 
There's also these um, ring illuminator that's available as well. Um, they are they are often used too. It really depends on how uniform you need in in your setting and what is more uh, basically. Yeah, it's it, 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 it's a trade off, right? Well, it's not a trade off. It's a, it's a balance, right? So it, it's it's how complicated the, the optical design you wanted to have, or how uniform, or you know, to a certain extent, it's it's good enough for for your illumination. Okay. Next question. Um, sorry, I'm getting loading. <laughs> OK, which parameters are important regarding camera in fluorescence gain? And can you explain it more? Uh, gain? Can I, mean, can I explain uh, for, gain? For, for instance, gain, yes. Oh, OK, so um, <laughs> I, I would definitely encourage you to uh, uh, watch our previous webinar by Martin, but uh, but so basically uh, gain is uh, internal amplification to the to the camera. Um, it doesn't really increase your signal, right? Because it's it's basically uh, taking the signal that it's captured from your from a sample and multiplying it, right? Um, then once once you have these electronic you know operations uh, or or yeah the, to to your to your image, there's going to be uh, noise that's added. So you really want to play the game in a sense that you get a good no, uh, signal to noise to an uh, to 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 an ideal si uh, signal to noise, but at the same time you you're really trying to optimize your image imaging system to get the best signal out of the sample and then the game will be um, I would say it will be an auxiliary um, to a, 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 an, opti an optimized optical system. And then um, in really important factors when you're choosing a camera, I would say uh, you you it's really your application dependent, right? So you wanted to look at the smallest feature you want to look at, and we talked about the, the pixel size of the of the uh, camera. You should choose the one that is about uh, a third of um, the, the 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 smallest feature that you want to look at in your sample after it's being magnified uh, by the uh, by the by, by the objective lens. And then another one to consider is really the sensitivity of the of the of, of, of the camera, right? If you're looking at very very dim sample, um, then you really wanted to look at uh, uh you know high quantum efficiency, um, and even like that. This is when uh electron uh, uh you know uh, multiplying becomes more important, right? So some of the application even call for what's called EMCCD, uh, that will have a lot of uh you know amplification on top of that. That's when you're looking really 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 dim, dim signal, um, and then uh, uh and another important factor is you want to compare the noise, right? Uh, you, you really wanted to have uh, low noise uh, regarding uh, the shot noise. Oh, no, sorry. Shot noise is, is something that's coming from your uh, sample. The uh, read noise, right? You want to compare the, the camera models to have uh, uh, the, the lowest read noise. Um, at you know the a similar similar speed um and then also thermal noise right uh, i know a lot of our cameras are actually hermetically sealed so uh, the, the the thermal noise part is very well managed um and then yeah and then whether you you need to go into cooling or not that really depends on if you have an acquisition time that is in the seconds range then you probably want to look into an active uh, actively cooled camera um yeah, and those are the those are the uh, major parameters that I will look into when I'm choosing a camera. Thank you for such detailed answer, and I think we're not having any more new questions. Uh, thank you all for attending, and we're looking forward to seeing you for our next webinar.